Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today, we are going to explore the influence of Native American culture on the founding of the United States government. My guest is Glenn Aparicio Perry. He is the author of Original Politics, Making America Sacred Again. And he has also written Original Thinking, a Radical Revisioning of Time, Humanity, and Nature. Welcome, Glenn. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be with you, Jeff. Since I've known you now for over a quarter of a century, you've been immersing yourself in dialogues with Native American elders. It goes back to 1983 when I was at the California Institute of Integral Studies and met Dan Moonhawk Alfred. That, he was my mentor into Native America. But particularly after coming to New Mexico in 1994, uh, I think the spiritual purpose of coming to New Mexico was to be in the heart of Native America. That's helped. Um, the first book that I wrote after retiring from the Seed Institute, Original Thinking, was more of a philosophy book, you know, giving a bit broad overview of worldviews. And this one, Original Politics, Making America Sacred Again, you know, picks up where original thinking left off and and grounds philosophy in the in, into the the world of human relations but it also it also goes it also expands the definition of politics to include the natural world which i think is imperative for the benefit of our viewers i might mention that you were one of the very first guests when i initiated the new thinking aloud series on youtube back in 2015 we did a couple of interviews then on your award winning book original thinking in fact i'm going to uh, link to uh, those early interviews in the upper right hand corner of your screen uh, our viewers will see a hot link and even later on if you're at your computer you can wave your mouse over the upper right hand corner and those hot links will appear again so uh Danny Alford who organized with you these conferences of quantum physicists with native american elders was Danny was a linguist. He was a good friend of mine uh, back in the days when I lived in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I, I believe that's when you yourself started this uh, immersion into Native culture. That's right. So so whatever was seeded by uh, my friendship with Moonhawk, which was a lifelong friendship, unfortunately, he, he died young, but... Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, he died in 2002 at age 54. But still, uh, for those years from 1983 to 2002, uh, Moonhawk and I definitely were buddies. And it was because of him uh, that the Seed Institute began the dialogues. Because Moonhawk was invited by, I think by his mentor, Sagesh Youngblood Henderson, uh, the head of the uh, Native Law Center in Saskatoon, to join the dialogues because the dialogues were, were a coming together of native scientists or native elders, Western scientists, and also linguists because linguists were the ones who mediated the, uh, the exchange in some ways. They, they were almost translators. <laughs> they, they, they were able to note certain important things, differences in the languages because in native language, it was all verbs, all process, and, and Western language is really noun dominant. That's just the simplistic view, but yeah, that was the basis, yes. I think that most people are just not aware of the fact that uh, um, the best way I can put it, and I think it's fair to say, is that Native American culture had an extraordinary influence on the founding of the United States government. Here's the way I look at it. Here's the way I approach it in the book. 
and surprisingly, a lot of people haven't even considered this, but European settlers coming over, and I'm not talking about the first explorers that just came and left because th- that happened, but, but, you know, from uh, Plymouth, you know, where, where settlers came bringing women and children, which was unusual, intent on staying, uh, from 1620 to 1776 is roughly 150 years, you know, and, and during that time, uh, obviously, uh, uh, European settlers and Native Americans were living side by side with each, with each other. And, um, you know, it's a great blessing to live in New Mexico to have uh, ample opportunity to interact with Native Americans. But imagine back in the, you know, 17th century, uh, then everybody interacted. Um, it was, there was so much opportunity to observe other cultures and interact with other cultures, depending on the the person some some European colonist really took to native culture, like Roger Williams. He is really Roger Williams is the forerunner of Ben Franklin. You know, so Roger Williams is coming over, you know, in 1632, and in a very short time, he befriends uh Miyano uh he befriends the Narragansett. He and then he he befriends the Wampanoag, um, and uh, Roger Williams was extremely open to Native American culture. Later on, he actually wrote a book, a key into the language of America, because he he had learned five Native American languages. He was the kind of guy that went out into the woods. He went, he learned native ways. He was familiar with that. And this was a Puritan preacher, presumably, right? He was a Puritan preacher. Um, but, you know, he was so radical that he, that they eventually want to throw him out of the church. He had to found his own movement and, and when he was essentially thrown out of, the, out of the church, he founds Rhode Island, which is then called the Bay of Rhode Island. And it was basically land given to him. I mean, he said it was purchased with love because they essentially gave it to him for very little. From, and I say they, the Native Americans who were, who were inhabiting that land, were very comfortable with Roger Williams. And when he went there, he took along with him other people that have been kind of pushed to the side by mainstream Christianity. And they were Quakers, Baptists, Jews, you know, the, the so-called misfits. No, <laughs> I'm, I'm speaking, you know, sarcastically sort of, but, but really um, Roger Williams was a very inclusive, loving man. Um, and, you know, he made great friendships with Native America. You said that Roger Williams learned five languages. I presume you mean five different Native American languages. Yes. I, I can't tell you which ones, but, uh, yeah, there are about five Native American languages. It's and he wrote the, he wrote the book called A Key into the Language of America, which is only the beginning of the title, which goes on for the entire book cover. <laughs> I told my publisher, do you want, she said, we need to give whole titles. I said, I, I, I'm not sure you want the whole title of this. And she agreed. In other words, he wrote a book about Native American languages. Well, he wrote, well, more importantly, going back to what we were speaking about before, having to do with the dialogue circles that brought together Native American elders and Western scientists, he, he wrote a book that demonstrated that language was the key to understanding culture and that language was the key to understanding the actual living continent. So here's the way I look at it. The the land, the land of America, the reason why I titled or subtitled the book, Original Politics, Making America Sacred Again, America in that, in that title is both, um, 
the nation and the place. It's the place that language emerges from. It's the land that speaks to Native Americans and when they're in communion with the land. They're in, you might call it prayer, but whatever it is, that close, intimate relationship springs forth that, that knowing that comes directly from the land. And that is how languages form. That's why the, the, the link in particularly what we tend to call sacred languages, which would include Hebrew, which would include Sanskrit, you know, those kinds of languages, those very ancient languages, they emerge together. You know, there, there, there's no separation between uh, what's coming from the land and what is being evoked. That's why they're sacred. So when you say those sounds, it evokes an energy. And so Roger Williams had an inkling of that. He understood that. Um, now, not every uh, European settler had understood that. In fact, most of them didn't and didn't have a clue. But some learned certainly how to speak, um, and that's only natural. They learned how to speak certain languages, and the and the Indians learned how to speak English. You know, and I'm using the word Indians. I also use it in the book. Um, I particularly use it then. And it's important when I say I particularly use it when we're talking in the 17th century. But the word Indian was then synonymous with the word American. The Indians were American. The, the founding fathers who started to call themselves American were uh, uh, different in that way. Um, but originally the word Indian and, and American were synonymous. And so basically, to go back to your question, all this cultural interaction affected the European colonizers. They were coming with their own, you know, uh, enlightenment worldview that believed in Western science. And it was an exciting time in the Enlightenment then where Western science was making all kinds of discoveries. And yet they encountered a, a new kind of science, a new way of knowing, a deep connection to the land, a deep ecological knowledge, a knowledge of the, the rivers, the streams, the, the mountains, the hills, the, the how, to, how to grow things, all these incredible amounts of food that were grown in, in, in Native America and are grown today on this continent. All of this was learned from Native America, but they also learned the politics. And the politics of Native America was such that it included the natural world in their planning. What was done was done for the greater good of all our relations. Whereas in Europe, the greater good, you know, after Socrates had come to mean, you know, the greater good of human beings. And that's really the big difference. Western politics doesn't include the natural world in our thinking. And we're seeing the, rep, you know, the, the consequences of that now with climate change and stuff. So we have to change. We have to get back to the original politics of Native America. That's the, that's the premise. That's what drove me to write this book. One of the things you wrote about that I found fascinating is that the Native Americans understood that North America was a continent and they called it Turtle Island. There are a lot of stories about uh, uh, this continent as being a turtle. And sometimes there are stories about the whole world being supported on the backs of turtles, as you know. So it's, uh, yeah, um, I almost, in my heart of hearts, I wanted to say that, uh, you know, making Turtle Island sacred again, I, I, I considered giving that title. I don't like to write linear history, like this happened then, and this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened, because history is really not about the past. It, it infiltrates, it's the ground of being that we're on. So, you know, I find it interesting, for instance, that, you know, going back to the 16, uh, you know, 17th century, after 
you know, Roger Williams comes after the Mayflower Pilgrims form a military alliance with uh, Masaoit, which is really the, that's not actually his name, but that's what he's referred to. Uh, I may not be able to pronounce his name, Osaquim or something is his name. Um, and he's a beloved head sachem of the tribes. They form a cultural alliance, a peaceful alliance for 55 years, and they form a military alliance too. And there is peace between the Mayflower Pilgrims and between Roger Williams' band and stuff for this long period of time. But they also they also took on other tribes in a war and nearly annihilated the Pequot, you know, in the 1630s. But it's the Pequot later in the 1990s who started the world's largest casino operation all of a sudden and that really irked donald trump when he his atlantic city casinos were faltering <laughs> so anyway trump bleeds into little parts of the book but but he's really uh, a trickster figure um not a witting trickster trickster he's an unwitting trickster figure you know i think it's fair to say that uh even though the pilgrims weren't as close to nature as the Native Americans they encountered. Compared to us, they were extremely close to nature. They didn't have telephones, cell phones, computers, electricity. That's a really interesting point. I think so, too. I think that they, that what's happened with uh, scientific... What happens in science, in Western science I'm talking about, um, when a worldview comes about, it takes a long time for it to gel. And even when a new worldview comes about, it takes a long time to, to penetrate the, the mainstream culture. So I would agree with you um, that the European colonizers, they were bringing the Enlightenment values and certainly people like Hamilton and Madison thought of themselves as on the forefront of creating a new politics that was almost like a new science. And they were excited about the scientific changes. But it wasn't as – it hadn't penetrated the culture so thoroughly that it became tacit knowledge. So it was still something kind of new then. And – I also think that they were coming to a new world and they were some, you know, certainly Washington, Jefferson, uh, obviously Ben Franklin, who I talk about a lot, um, were very open to Native American views um, and Roger Williams before. Um, and so even though they were influenced by the by the scientific values and they were kind of emphasizing certain kinds of technology like mills and forges and and cannonballs and ammunition and there there were some technological advances that that made their way into the new world um they also were not as fixed in their beliefs i think that's your point i i agree with that their lives were probably no more different than the Native Americans of their era than, than we're different today from the Native Americans of our era. I mean, I don't think they had plumbing, for example. certainly think they would live a little closer to nature than what um, the average uh, urbanite does today. But from my reading, uh, the men like Roger Williams, who went out into the wild, um, were relatively rare that most of the most of the European settlers were careful when they went out into the uh, wild and stayed to their settlements I, they, they weren't as comfortable with nature as Native Americans that was their learning here's a clue um, everyone probably is aware that one of the what we consider a racial slur today is that European colonizers called Indians savages, right? And perhaps it is a racial slur, but I, but it also needs a little context because the word savage has changed a little bit over time. So it really meant wild and untamed. And so 
uh, the uh, the Europeans observed that Native Americans were more comfortable in the wild. You know, so I think that that was partly the association, um, and it was it was rampant. That that term was used all the time. It was used by Ben Franklin, who really had deep abiding friendships with Native Americans. That's why I suspect that the word wasn't quite the racial slur we imagine it to be today. Um, obviously, over time, savage has become to be distinguished from, you know, civilized, you know. And even then, I think that that was a distinction that the, that the colonizers were trying to make. They were arrogant in a lot of ways. They thought that they had some superior knowledge. Um, but they also very quickly learned that they better pay attention to the wisdom and working knowledge of the native people or they wouldn't su survive. And so many of them did. And they did particular, and they did in particular pay attention having to do with the politics. That's really what, uh, can we, it's not you, it's me that's talking about it. <laughs> Yeah, I want to focus on that if we can. Is that okay, Jeff? I think the obvious focus, Glenn, is that when the founding fathers came together, they wanted to overthrow the rule of monarchs. They wanted to do away with the social hierarchies and the feudal system that had existed for centuries in Europe. And when they looked at the Native American tribes around them, they saw an egalitarian society that served as something of a role model. That's, that's exactly right. So they, in in all ways so uh, and and for 150 years the european settlers were observing this they were observing the uh more egalitarian society and they they were inspired by that but here's the thing they took the their inspiration uh, as much as they wanted to as much as they wanted to assimilate or appropriate, they took, in some cases very directly, um, and in other cases they ignored other aspects of the truly egalitarian Native American societies and ignored that. So one of the big emphasis of my book is how much Native American women were included in the political structure. And obviously, the founding fathers did not include the women, um, despite Abigail Adams saying to to her husband John that don't forget the ladies. You know, uh, they 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 did. And in my research, I was shocked to find out that it wasn't just that the founding fathers did not. Uh, give the vote to women, they actually took it away from them. So during the, during the time of the colonies, if you were a property owner, you could vote. <laughs> you had a say. Um, and even if you were a female property owner, you had a say. And in and some, uh, uh, people of color, who were property owners could have a say in the colonies. But uh, what happened in the founding of the nation and particularly with the constitution, when we got to the constitution, that power was given to the states. And then the states started to write specific laws in there to exclude. They wrote those laws that excluded uh, anybody except white male property owners. And that's the way they wrote it. But that's just... But that's just one one thing that they did. Women in Native America had complete equality. Complete equality. Um, now, they had different gender roles. But so, for instance, in the Haudenosaunee or the Iroquois, uh, which is the group that both profoundly influenced the founding fathers and Ben Franklin 
with the founding of the nation, and also later in the 19th century profoundly influences what I call the founding mothers, the uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucretia Mott, Matilda Gage, who are living in upstate New York, to form the beginning of the first women's movement, you know, um, those Haudenosaunee women, they were the ones who appointed the male chief. And they had the right to remove him if he screwed up. And that's not the end of their role at all. Um, they also had the right to call a council. They basically were putting the men in the position of enacting what had already been decided in the wisdom of the women's council as the strategic plan or vision of the tribe. And that vision, again, included what was best for the whole tribe um, and for all their relations, including the, the animals and plants and, you know, that they lived with. You know, this is, this is all part of the, the nation, really. Um, so I like that phrase, all our relations. I hear it frequently when I'm around you and uh, other people who are close to Native American culture. Yeah, and it's usually in the Lakota, Mitaka Oyasin, uh, and uh, which just means all our relations. But I think it's true across the board that there's some always a concept of uh, inclusivity of the natural world. The political actions of human beings are not limited to the benefit to human beings. There's a consideration of the natural world. We have to do that. I mean, because uh, we human beings are composed of light, air, water, earth. If you want to say spirit, we are made of the elements. The very idea that we can just live our lives independent of nature is a really disastrous idea, you know, or that we can despoil the environment and that it won't come back on us is very misguided. So when we, when we try to look at land only as a resource, an economic resource to be pillaged, and we drill through water to just try to extract some oil, and then we in, have the inevitable oil spill and we despoil the, the water, we're despoiling our health. And Native people always understood this. They always understood they couldn't be healthy on a diseased or distressed planet. And we're really feeling the consequences of that now, you know, with COVID-19 and uh, a lot of the diseases that come in to uh, affect, infect human beings, animal pathogens are caused because human beings have in pose themselves on animal habitats to such a degree that we are living in, in, in a proximity we're not intended to live. And that's why some of these diseases come from bats and pigs and things like that. So let's talk about the Iroquois Federation. I don't think people realize that even before the articles of uh, the Confederacy or the Confederation were written prior to the American Constitution, the Native American tribes had already formed a federation of their own. Yeah, there's different accounts of when the Haudenosaunee uh, formed their confederacy. But that's that's the key opening premise of the book. Um, I think it was a very, very long time ago. There's, by some accounts, it was 1132 AD. Um, all we do know is that oral tradition says that they formed their confederacy at a time of great strife where the, the various tribes, the Oneida, the Seneca, the Cayuga, the Mohawk, and the Onondaga. There were five first. Later on, the Tuscarosa got added. So these five uh, were fighting amongst themselves. And they say that at that time, Peacemaker is born. And in some tellings of the tale, there's a lot of parallels to Jesus, actually. I mean, so, sometimes you hear a Peacemaker being born from a virgin birth. But in any case... Um, Peacemaker is from a different tribe or outsider, really, 
But Peacemaker comes and uh, he befriends uh, Jikonsana first, uh, which is a, uh, a woman, and teaches her about a way of peace. Uh, later, Hiawatha uh, um, is won over. And eventually, all five of the nations are won over except for... Uh, this one evil man, Tadadado, um, who has like almost like Medusa, has snakes in his hair, and he's he's very resistant. But the peacemaker wins over Tadadado by giving him responsibility um, to be for the Anandaga to be the uh, the central fire, the the almost equivalent to the executive branch of the nations um, and peace is made and when they make peace they they look for a symbol of peace which is an evergreen tree because they want an everlasting they partially uproot the tree to create a cavity they bury their weapons underneath there and the roots the the white or the great white roots of peace go out to the north the south the east the west the four directions, um, and they make this sacred pact. Um, and that, uh, that confederacy is what becomes what the, the, the colonists do. Now, the particular link was Ben Franklin. And here's how it happened. Ben Franklin was given the responsibility uh, to be the ambassador to create a military alliance with the Iroquois. Um, it wasn't just Ben Franklin. There were a couple other people but, uh, that were sent up there, but the impact on Ben Franklin was the greatest. And remember that Ben Franklin had already been a, he was a printer who had a long standing practice of printing treaties that happened between Indian nations and Native Americans. And when he became a, uh, when he became a politician, um, he often took the side of the Indians when he was talking about these treaties and actually lost his seat once. Um, and most people felt he lost his seat because he was siding with the Indians too much. He already had a certain affection and understanding of culture before he forms this really important friendship with Chief Kana Asteko. Um, who's the, the the chief of the Anadaga. And when he forms this partnership, Kana Astego, uh, he is the one who later, and incredibly, on July 4th, 1744, he addresses the colonists and he urges them to unify as one. And he uses the same symbolism, which is in the Peacemaker story, about uh, arrows. Um, he uh, Legend has it that he gave Ben Franklin one arrow. And Ben Franklin, as he's about to examine the arrow, Chief Kana Stego takes it away and breaks it over his knee. And then he reaches behind him and pulls out a sheaf of perhaps it's 13 bundled arrows, or at least it was a sheaf of bundled arrows. And again, he, he breaks it over uh, or tries to break it over his knee. It doesn't break. Ben Franklin remembered that and later incorporated it into the great seal of the United States, where it's in the left hand of the left talon of the eagle. When the Articles of Confederation are written, they are really a rendering of the great law of peace. The president, and there was a president, there were eight presidents after the Articles of Confederation were ratified until before George Washington, actually. The president serves a one-year term. He doesn't have any power except for the power derived from the trial. And that is the, that is the basis of the first true founding document of the United States. People all seem to think that the Constitution is the founding document of the United States. And frankly, you know, I, it, it really isn't. I mean, in 1781, 
uh, the United States was recognized as a country by France and Morocco. The Articles of Confederation were ratified. And then for the next eight years, that was the prevailing document in the United States. And there was just one legislature. The president was very similar to like the vice president is today overseeing the Senate. He pre- this, the president presided. He didn't have the powers. And then, you know, then Alexander Hamilton and James Madison had other ideas. They really felt that the presidency had to be strengthened. And in many ways, you can see why they were right, um, because um, what had happened is the, the founders, and particularly Ben Franklin, who was very influential, had uh, gotten this Articles of Confederation through that was so closely aligned with Indian ways, but didn't quite work for Europeans because Europeans were still too tied to money. They were tied to a money economy. So, for instance, the Articles of Confederation only called for a voluntary contribution from the states. And when the Revolutionary War happened, the country went into debt and the states were not paying up. So Alexander Hamilton correctly saw, I would say, that they needed to change that um, because they were not going to be able to survive for the long term. So in a way, they could have survived under the Articles of Confederation if they had different values, but they valued money. You know, they valued money too much. They couldn't break away from that. And so they did the Constitution, which was a, which, you know, they sold the, the Constitutional Convention as a gathering that would revise the Articles of Confederation, but it actually really supplanted it. It was hugely different, but it still retained connection to Native America. It still had a lot of Native American influence, which has been recognized. It was recognized in the Reagan administration in the 1980s. And uh, uh, it's recognized because of great work by people like Bruce Johansson, um, who had written his doctoral dissertation about the influence of Native America on the founding of the United States. Isn't it the case, Glenn, that the Iroquois Federation agreements were preserved in uh, a native cultural form, as I recall? They they were actually written in uh, what are known as wampum belts. Yeah, wampum belts. And weren't these wampum belts also used as sort of a form of currency? Well, uh, I suppose so, yes. Um, I'm not that knowledgeable about that, um, but uh, uh, wampum belts kept the oral history. Well, they didn't keep the oral history, but that was a that was a form of written history, actually. And then there's also the oral tradition that that is uh, relied upon heavily to retain the history. So. When people like Benjamin Franklin were uh, drafting the Articles of Confederation, uh, did they have access to these uh, Indian Native records in the uh, recorded in wampum belts? Yeah, I'm not sure how Ben Franklin had it. If he actually was going by the wampum belts or by or by uh, hearing it, you know, out loud, Um, but he did completely understand the great law of peace. And that's how he designed it. I mean, and this has been very well documented. Um, as late as uh, 1942, there was a historian that, that showed how Ben Franklin basically took the ideas of the Iroquois and, and to create the Articles of Confederation. You know, this is a very fundamental and important history. And the striking thing to me, because I was a good student and I studied civics and American history, this was never taught. This is valuable information. And uh, I think I have to commend you, Glenn. You're doing a wonderful job of bringing it to the light of day. Well, thank you. But I'm really standing on the backs of other remarkable people, you know, I mentioned Bruce Johansson, uh, Stephen Sachs, Sally Roche Wagner, uh, 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 Donald Grind, uh, many others, um, 
probably about 20 others have been doing this work in the last quarter century. Um, and, th- and some of them did the really hard work, you know, the delving into the letters of George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. So a lot of that groundwork had have been, have been done. And uh, um, I, we're talking today mainly about the first part of the book. Um, my vision for original politics, making America sacred again, had four parts. And uh, uh, the first part I called unit of consciousness. The second part I called dance of the opposites. The third part I called maximum diversity. And the fourth part, return to wholeness. The the first part of the book then focuses a lot on the influence of Native America on the founding of the United States. And that influence is still here. You know, it really is still here. It never went away. Um, but it stopped being recognized. I will say that it was recognized for the first 50 years of the country. So it's really only when Andrew Jackson comes in, you know, uh, and institutes the Indian Removal Act in 1830 and begins what is a full on extermination campaign against Native America that the that the influence of the founding fathers uh, influence upon the founding fathers by native America was marginalized or forgotten because it's just, you know, as I mentioned in the book, it's just, this happens every time there's a war, the enemy always has to be dehumanized. So for the first 50 years of this country, native American nations worked with the, United States government on a nation to nation basis. And they had a lot of military alliances. They worked together in, on that aspect also. But once we, you know, once we started to, you know, once Andrew Jackson comes in and he rounds up the, 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 the Creek, the Chickasaw, the, the Cherokee, the Seminole, you know, and, and 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 moves them all the way out to Oklahoma in a horrible ways or kills them outright. Um, then we're into what's known as the Indian Wars, which are really wars on Indians. And you know the Indian Wars can be said to be started in the 17th century because there were certainly wars then, but it wasn't really until Andrew Jackson that it was a full scale extermination campaign, which continues for another hundred years. And that's, of co- that's of course when we started to forget or didn't want to remember the influence we had, but it's very important that we do. And it's not only important that we remember it, it's important that we recover it and that we take on those values, those ecological values, if we are going to survive and thrive. Well, Glenn Aparicio Perry. I, I want to let our viewers know that we have several more interviews planned. This is the first in a series of interviews based on your book, Original Politics. We'll look further, more deeply at, at some of the tragic history of Native American relationships with the United States government. So I encourage our viewers to Check the listings for future programs. And I want to thank you very much, Glenn, for being with me. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. And uh, thank you for everything you do. You know, and by the way, I'm reading your book now, The PK Man, (laughs) which is incredible. Thank you. Thank you. And for those of you watching, thank you for being with us. Mm -hmm.